Hello, this is Howard Chazen. I'm going to give you a talk today on the challenges in generic drug safety and surveillance. I'm the director of the Clinical Safety Surveillance Staff. We call that the CS Cubed or CSSS in CEDARS Office of Generic Drugs. I'm going to give you a little bit of an outline for what I'm going to talk to you about today. First, I'm going to give you an example of what that I mean by challenges in clinical safety for generic drugs. I'm going to tell you a little bit about how generic drugs are different from new drugs. I'm going to lead this into why we are concerned about generic drug safety and some of the challenges we face, and end with another example. Here on my slide, you'll see two boxes, a blue one and an orange one. One's a little bigger than the other. This example is about clonidine. It, clonidine is also known as catapress. It's a blood pressure drug, and it's put into a patch. It's indicated for the treatment of hypertension. FDA received 89 reports of a lack of adhesion and efficacy on a new generic product. MedWatch, the FDA uh, system for receiving post-marketing safety from consumers, and from companies noted the large size of the generic patch. For 0.3 milligrams per day, the brand was 10.5 centimeters squared. And in my simple math, that's two centimeters by five centimeters to get about 10, a little close to 10.5 centimeters squared. And that is represented by the blue rectangle on the slide. For the generic, it was 32.4 centimeters squared which is also represented as three centimeters by 10 centimeters on the slide. So it gets you about 30 centimeters squared. So you can see the relative difference in size. FDA had an inspection that showed significant manufacturing problems with the generic product. A warning letter, letter was issued to the generic manufacturer on May 21st, 2010. The generic applicant voluntarily removed the generic patch in March 2011. So here the example was about the fact that the patch was a different size and it didn't stick very well. It was allowed to be different because generics can't be exactly the same as their um, brand counterparts. Sometimes there's an issue like a, um, a patent or an issue that has to be dealt with. So in this case, the generic patch was almost three times bigger than the brand patch. And of course, sticking that onto your arm every day would fold, it would fall off and that cause those problems. So in order to get to uh, what we call a foundation for the identity of generic drugs, we have to look at what I call here the magic triangle or magic pyramid. We have to think about where do we go what it is makes up generic drugs evaluation and what brings us into a concern about safety. Here you'll see um, the building blocks basically for generic drugs. It starts with chemistry, moves up through something called pharmaceutical equivalence, moves on to bioequivalence, and then takes clinical relevance into effect when the generic drug is placed into a clinical situation. So each of these I have to think about um, separately. First, chemistry is your base chemical. What is the drug made of? When you get to something called pharmaceutical equivalence, that gets to be about the active ingredient itself, the dosage form. Is it a tablet or a capsule? The route of administration. Do you take it orally or is it a patch? The strength, quality, purity, and identity. Pharmaceutical equivalence also known as PE, is described more in what we call the orange book, because it's orange. And this here are the approved drug products that's put out multiple times a year uh, that updates all the approved generic drug products. But in order, like I said before, the two different patches were different because they were allowed to be different. So we have something called allowable differences in the regulations for generic drugs. This is way generic drugs can differ in shape, the way the tablet might be scored, the way it's released in the body, packaging, 
excipients, which are supposed to be inactive ingredients, but sometimes aren't, and expiration time. And labeling as well, within certain limits, labels can be somewhat different. That's the, that's the um, information that comes with the drug for patient information and for physician information. Here I'm going to show on the slide I just put up some different capsules. But actually, they're all the same. The, the um, brand name Prozac, very well-known antidepressant, is seen up at the top with an orange and green capsule. Below that are four different generic forms of Prozac or fluoxetine, and they're allowed to be different to colors like this. Blue, white with orange stripes, per, you know, blue with blue and orange, white and blue. This is because we allow the capsule to be different. But sometimes patients will receive this, know they first started on Prozac, get the new tablet and think maybe the pharmacist made a mistake. Why do I have these new different looking capsules? Sometimes the dispensing might be every 30 days and you might get a different um, pill in um, your bottle and therefore you would um, might might think that there might be a problem with your tablets. Next, I'm going to move into bioequivalence. Bioequivalence is when we take a look at the product after it's in the body and we see how well it works. Basically, the generic and brand drug should deliver the same amount of the active drug at the same rate. The bioequivalence drug and the pharmaceutical equivalence generic drug will, should perform in the same way as the brand drug when it's given in your body. Here are two curves. This is basically how much a drug is given with the amount on the left side of the, on the vertical and the time in hours on the horizontal. And um, when we try to decide whether or not something's bioequivalent or not equivalent, we have to compare the time course we expect from the brand to the generic. So here, the reference or, gen or brand drug is in green. And we're going to look at two different generics as our test product. On the left set of curves, the generic performs almost equally to the brand, and the curves are almost superimposable. On the right, however, the generic doesn't perform as well, and it doesn't have as high a peak, and it doesn't have as much exposure or drug released over time. So the left generic would be bioequivalent, and the right generic would, be, would not be bioequivalent. So when we talk about the differences between generic drugs and brand drugs, we think about the new drug application, or NDA, versus the abbreviated new drug application, or ANDA, requirements. When you compare brand name drug to generic drug, some of the things are actually the same. FDA expects certain things in the application. The chemistry base is the same. We talked about that. The manufacturing should be relatively the same. The controls for those are the same. The labeling, as we said, except for some exceptions, should be the same. And testing of product lots should reveal that these are consistent. But for a new drug, we f allow and have to develop a new chemical, we have to make sure it's, it's safe in animals before we move, move into humans. And then we do clinical studies in uh, new drugs, and we do bioavailability studies for liquid products. But for generic drugs, we use bioequivalents to stand in for formal animal studies and clinical studies. So with only using the bioequivalent data, comparing curves and expecting a product to work in the body, we are skipping some steps. But of course, we're doing that on purpose. We want, that's, that's why the ANDA stands for abbreviated new drug application requirements. If we required the same testing for a generic drug as a new drug, it would take years to get generic drugs on the market. So then we have to think, OK, pharmaceutical equivalents and bioequivalents are fine. But if you give the product, you have to make sure it's, do, it's given the same clinically relevant way. What do I mean by that? I mean that the clinical effect and the safety profile when administered to patients under conditions and labeling, 
how it's supposed to be given should be the same. So I, if I give you a brand Prozac or a generic Prozac, no matter you know how the capsules look, they should be the same. They should be they should be what's called substitutable, and that includes how long the drug should act. So if I give you a drug that's supposed to act in 12 hours, the generic should work in 12 hours as well. The indication should be the same, meaning that they again, the brand, when you get the generic, it should be properly used in the same set of patients and the same kind of target populations. Is this for adults? Is this for geriatrics? Is this for pediatrics? So all these um, thought processes get involved in generic drug development. So when you think about all the things I just went through very quickly, since this is not a long talk, this is a summary of what we say is, why worry about generic drug safety? It's a good question. We've tried to cover bioequivalence, pharmaceutical equivalence, clinical relevance in our assessment of generic drugs before we approve them. But sometimes unexpected safety considerations and concerns happen over time. Why does this happen? Sometimes generic drug use is more, mi more widespread because the brand is tested in patients, it gets out into the uh, population, and then some people get it, and then uh, once it becomes a generic and more affordable, a lot more people get it in a lot more diverse population. Sometimes when patients are switched from a brand to a generic, they get the generic for the first time, they're used to the brand, and sometimes they feel that the generic feels different. It's, sometimes a patient gets one generic to another generic, like the Prozac example, they'll walk in and they'll say, these pills look different, and they feel that they may be acting different, but that may not be true. So when I talk about post-marketing surveillance of generic drugs, I'm trying to say that we are concerned about unexpected safety considerations in generic products. Examples could include that the generic drug itself with, an, with its allowable differences has caused some adverse events, some problems. For example, an excipient, an inactive ingredient, could have an independent effect that was not foreseen when the drug was put together. There could be quality problems with the product where the tablets are falling apart or the packaging is not working or the injector is not working. Sometimes, and this is very common, is that patients perceive that the generic drug itself is inferior. The chemistry is the same. It should work the same. We know it's approved to work the same. Yet people say, this generic doesn't work so well. Sometimes there's contamination, and sometimes we get concerns for a difference in a safety profile, especially when drugs are being used off-label or in, a, um, in an indication or in a population we ne it has never been tested in before. There are many quality issues and complaints that come in sometimes to our group. Sometimes tablets are breaking apart. Sometimes the tablets don't break evenly when split. Sometimes the tablets might be a different size and stick in the throat. There might be an unusual odor or taste or smell or texture. In oral liquids and injectables, there might be something that's not dissolved. It's a precipitate. As we saw in my first example, patches don't stick right. Sometimes there's a container closure issue or a dropper issue, an issue with an injector such as a device issue. And sometimes, like I said earlier, a large size tablet or capsule looks different and feels different. Here you'll see a little picture of um, some beige colored tablets on a green background. If you look very carefully, you'll see three larger looking caplets to the right of that picture. This was sent in to us for an evaluation of concern about safety. During the manufacture of these particular products, the press that was making and compressing the tablets was got overfilled and a lot of the products, a lot, not many, but a certain lot or a number of these caplets became larger, slightly larger than the ones you see on the left and above. And we were asked, is there a safety concern for this? Should we take these off? Should we pull these off the market? And after assessment, we said yes, for several reasons. One, they look different. Someone might think they're a different drug. 
two, they might not um, break evenly when they get scored, or they might stick in the throat. The fact is they were they are the same per se, but they look different. And if you received a bottle of these and there were 30 and there were three that looked different, you might think to yourself again, there's something wrong with these. So we ask that these be removed from the market to avoid any future safety issues. We get information from a lot of different sources. You know, people contact us directly from the public. They'll send letters right in and emails right into our uh, office director. The MedWatch, which I spoke about before, is FDA's formal way for um, consumers and companies to report problems with products right to FDA directly, and that's on the web. FDA has its own internal databases to assess drug safety. Other regulatory agencies, like the VA, um, might, uh, might uh, contact us if they're having an issue with a product. And manufacturers themselves send in reports of safety concerns that they themselves have generated or have come to them through outside sources. Sometimes we see this in the scientific literature as well. And here's my little plug for the FDA MedWatch. Um, if you yourself have had ever had a problem with a product, I encourage you to report it to FDA MedWatch. Well, as I'm closing down this talk, I have one more example for you before I go. And this may again illustrate some of the issues we see. This uh, example is about lorazepam oral concentrate. Lorazepam is a sedative, and in this particular one is a liquid. And you can see a picture of the vial there. Um, it's given with a dropper, mostly to young children. Um, it's indicated for the treatment of anxiety. It's used with a calibrated dropper, as I said already, and used in children and other seniors and all, or anyone who has trouble swallowing tablets, because typically this is given as a tablet. Um, we received a report that there were some misprinted droppers. On my picture here, you'll see the correctly printed dropper on your left. Uh, the next three droppers you'll see were incorrectly printed. One was printed upside down, one was printed only partially or shifted, and one had no print at all. And FDA was asked, would this be a problem? Well, yes, it would be a problem because this has to be measured very carefully. And if it wasn't measured carefully, people would get either underdosed or overdosed since the dropper comes with the bottle. So fortunately, the company recalled these droppers and products and uh, last August, 13 affected lots were withdrawn and recalled and put the droppers out with a correct print and all was well. So that's my talk and I hope this gives you an idea of some of the reasons why we would have some challenges with generic drug safety. I'd like to acknowledge CEDARS Office of Generic Drugs, our Deputy Office Director John Peters, our Clinical Safety Surveillance staff, including Debbie Catterson, our Lead Safety Coordinator, our data team consisting of Jim Osterhut, Jung Lee, and Ed Kim, and our clinical team, Karen Fibus and Linda Forsyth. I also want to thank CEDARS Office of Surveillance and Epidemiology and CEDARS Office of Pharmaceutical Quality for their help in getting me some of these examples. Thank you. Thank you very much for your talk. It's been a pleasure.